And he's covered a large number of topics in uh, ranging from 19th century poetry to garden history. Now, um, no one quite does glamour like the French, and academic glamour, we hope to compete here, but they still do it pretty well. And I'm not going to do my pronunciation in the room of such distinguished people. But nevertheless, he is a Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters, by recommendation of the French Minister of National e Education, and also a Knight of the Order of Academic Palms. That's really desirable. <laughs> and um, that's France's highest non-military honor for academics, created by Napoleon, whose name we normally just whisper here. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Haskell spoke um, at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which partnered with us on this great exhibition, Painting the Modern uh, Garden. Um, I'd also like to say a particular thank you to uh, Mrs. Gabrielle Jungels Winkler. It's through her auspices that we're having this great event, and I'm sorry to say she can't be with us, but her daughter, Alexandra, is here to represent the family. We're enormously grateful. She also helped with the redecoration of this room. This is 24 karat gold, which even made the Prince of Wales's jaw drop. On with that point, I'm delighted to hand over to Eric Haskell. Thank you. I think we better get it right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I want to thank especially uh, Dr. Lebrun, uh, Professor Lebrun. It's not every day that I get to say the word Lebrun, uh, a, a person who's introducing me. And you know, probably somewhere in your ancestry, um, it was another Lebrun decorating the Hall of Mirrors ceiling and also Volvicomte. So it's a great honor to be introduced by you. Can I take you back to America with me? It's amazing. <laughs> I want to also thank Beth and Sarah and Kira and all the team here at the Royal Academy has been so kind in receiving me and especially our own Julie Cornell for helping us uh, make the liaison. Uh, first and foremost though, I want to really congratulate the Royal Academy for the dazzling success of this exhibition, Painting the Modern Garden uh, from Monet to Matisse and uh, certain thanks go to RA Curator Anne Dumas, who has assembled a truly stellar collection of pictures and displayed them here with intellectual verve, as pleasing to the mind as it is to the eye. And I'm telling you, it is very pleasing to the eye. In Cleveland, they had a lot of loot to look at, but they didn't have your arrangement of little glass houses in that one grand room. It's pretty wonderful. I have 5,000 pictures to show them how to do it next time. <laughs> Co-hosted with Ohio's Cleveland Museum of Art, this exhibition really exemplifies, in my mind, the best of Anglo-American collaborations. It also brings to the public in America and here in Great Britain a long overdue appraisal of how modern painters have used the garden as a site of inspiration, seeking in its verdant enclaves a respite from the rigors of what now we know is high-octane activity induced by the phenomenon of modern life, Baudelaire's term. And as we see, some of these painters even sought a sense of peace in their representations and in their making of gardens, a peace after first the Franco-Prussian War, and especially after the cataclysmic effects of World War II. Now, I'm profoundly honored to speak here today at this amazing beautiful museum. If I'm here today, it's through the generosity of RA trustee, Gabriel Jungels Winkler, who also happens to be an alumna and a trustee of my institution in California, Scripps College. Her philanthropy knows no bounds, and her always strategic gifts have benefited the RA in 24 karat gold, and also in my institution in very profound ways. The two of us share a passion for Scripps College, and along with that, we have a long-standing friendship that has enriched my life in many ways, and sadly, due to her illness today, she's unable to join us. But I'm so glad that Alexandra is where? Where are you, Alexandra? 
there. Thank you so much for driving in this morning from the country to be here to stand in for your mother. We all wish and that you will convey to her our best wishes for a quick recovery. I have many, many dear friends here. I can just say that they start right at the top with my Anglo-American godson and his parents and many, many friends from California. I think David, David Alexander's Catherine is here. Yes, all the way from my own city. She's the wife of my former president of my university. Catherine, welcome. And I have friends like Sue Henze, who's come from Greenwich, Connecticut, with her pal Marianne Astor from England. I hope you made it, Sue. And to everyone here, including all of the Scripps contingency, please know that I am grateful for your spending this afternoon here when you could just be working in your garden. So, Mike goal, and let's set it out right up front, is to contextualize Monet's two lifelong passions, which happening, happen to be in this order, gardening and painting. This will allow us to understand his absolute radical passage from 19th century representation to 20th century abstraction. Huge, huge sentence, but don't worry, we've got plenty of time to talk about it. Some of you have to leave and go back to work at two, but I'll, I'll just walk and leave, that's fine. So Monet's movement from 19th century figuration to new ways of looking at everything in non-figurative terms, even bordering on abstraction, is what this is all about. Introduction to modernity seen through his eyes and really the focal point for this afternoon. However, the effectiveness of my presentation will be increased dramatically if we first frame Monet's gardening within the rich context of French landscape history in just a couple of slides, and especially within the mid-17th century frame where France invented its greatest garden legacy of all, and that was the French formal garden. Could we get some lights down a little bit more? I don't know, Johnny, if that's possible, but it's still pretty light in here. All notable lectures begin with a question. This is a rough one, and it will not be on the final exam in an hour. Can anyone identify this early French gardener? Mm. Ho-hum, ho-hum. He made that. He made that. Anyone got it? Le Nôtre, thank you. You can all do wonderful on this exam. I'm so pleased. Yes, this is André Le Nôtre. He is an early Monet, and he also studies painting. But he gives it all up because Louis XIV is bedraggling him to a daily 24-7 task at making gardens for 22 of his residences, but most importantly for Versailles. Um, he starts by, oh, I pressed the wrong button, I think. There, yeah, there we go. He starts by making this garden. Can anyone identify that? I hear it. I hear it. Volvicomte. Sue, so hi. Volvicomte, indeed, yes. 1661, Fouquet, as Minister of Finances, gives a vast party here, a great fete, and ends up in prison for 19 years for having upstaged a sun king or potential sun king. But this gardening, as you can tell, with its two and a half story statue of Hercules Farnese covered in gold, um, it, it, focal point of this garden is all about a would-be king himself. So if you were king, you're going to get rid of him as fast as you can and up one him and go from 16,000 to 30,000 acres of wonderful formal French gardens that Le Nôtre will create here in the most important of all sites of the formal landscape. Question number two, can anyone identify this gentleman? It's gonna be easy, huh? okay, you got it. So um, Monet, we all know so well that even this modern couple that je heart Monet, they've understood it all. But actually, I'm not so sure that all of us understand this site at Giverny, which has been called by me the Louvre of modern gardens. And so we're going to spend some time talking about this site, and I'll show you what interests me in four pictures. What interests me is beginnings of garden. In fact, mud flats, basically. And by the, by the way, in the early 70s, when I visited this site, because my father-in-law said, oh, I used, to, I used to ride my bicycle by Giverny, and I would see him out there painting. I said, you what? 
And so, of course, we, we went here and found a little man parked on the side of the road with a truck and carpentry tools, and he had some pieces of wood, and he, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm here to rebuild the bridge. The bridge has been washed out five times since 1900, and um, so, of course, it had to be reconstructed all the time, and here it is, but this is unbelievably stark and minimalist, sort of a 21st century view of Giverny until Monet really gets busy and starts planting it for one sole reason, to paint it. And you all know these images. So we've gone from nothing to something to art. And eventually from here, because everyone in this room looks at this, I'm, I promise you, and you all said bridge or something else close to that, pong. And then if I hadn't showed you this right before, some of you might wonder and say, pong? Bridge? So that's where we're going. We're headed across that bridge to this. Any questions about this so far? Good. <laughs> so here's where we're going, and we're going to follow a little bit just to open up the terrain to get to Giverny, a little bit of this itinerary that will be Monet's itinerary. So he's born up in Le Havre, right up here, and he comes down to study art in Paris. It's easy to think about Monet, simple. He's born in 1840. He dies in 1926, easy for a third of this audience because that's the year Scripps College has started. And we have basically Monet 43 years BG, before Giverny, and 43 years AG, at Giverny. So there you have it. I'm gonna simply spend a moment of the BG so that you can understand the AG. Most artists, as you know, sort of select their, their subject by Cezanne arranging some pears on a tray, but Monet is going to plant his subject and, as we'll see, paint it over 500 times at Giverny, many more times than that, but you know he's a big destroyer of his own works, never happy with them. So we're going to look at that. We're going to then see that Monet is going to go back the coast and paint a lot before he comes back at the midway point called Giverny. Here he is, he's slightly French revolutionized up there with his haircut, but here's the deal. Monet's 20 years old when he arrives in Paris, and he's going to start painting right away. And what is he going to paint? Le Jardin de la Princesse, the front door of the Louvre. He's going to start big time, and of course, the rest of Paris out there. A suitable topic for someone who's eventually going to have his own garden. He's going to move on to uh, the Boulevard des Capucines and paint an entirely new notion of what painters should paint, and that is this flaneur, this just a passerby here in the Boulevard des Capucines, absolutely unworthy of the Salon or any traditions of academic painting. 1873, and we're going to see that what interests Monet is la vie moderne. Then he starts going over the edge and painting such things as the new Gare Saint-Lazare, which now has structural sort of a glass house above it to keep the cool out in winter, but the glass house keeps all the pollution in. He's crazy about pollution. <laughs> He should come to California with you, Christopher, because seriously, in all regards, he would love that sight of smog. Monet is good at painting it, and he's going to make smog à la mode. His father writes him from Le Havre and says, get it into your head that you're going to work seriously now. What? <laughs> I want to see you in a studio. Mm, not so much. <laughs> Under the discipline of a reputable master, if you decide to be independent, I shall cut you off without a penny. Am I making myself clear? Does it sound like your parents when you're growing up? Am I making myself clear? So for his father and for everybody else, except for some young renegades in France, painting was about this. Or three, two other topics, religious painting. Here's the Frère Lambour from the 15th century, a crucifixion shot, perfect. Or a mythological shot here by Claude Lorrain, um, Dido and Aeneas here in Carthage having a good time. And this is also a possibility 
because like religious painting, it is didactic and it shows models for proper living. And the third and very popular area is going to be this. Grand master portraits, grand manor paintings. This one by Rigaud of Louis XIV when he ha uh, takes on a month or two of slim fast diet in 1700 and has all of his coronation gowns let out again. This is about 65 year, years old. <laughs> God, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and lets them all out and has him, himself done up like this by Rigaud and has these turned out for trinket gifts across Europe. It's life-size portrait, of course. So this is another great possibility, and just to be reminded, this is not. <laughs> so in 1873, he's going to paint Impression Soleil Levant, and what we're looking at is the port of Le Havre, home sweet home, and um, this is uh, absolutely out of any possibility of something that would be acceptable by the Salon, so it's going to go in 1874 to the Salon des Impressionnistes. Listen to what Frédéric Chevalier has to say about it. This painting, it's an effervescence of color, a phantasmagoria of effects, a bacchanalia of lines, a fury of brushstrokes, an orgy of impastos, an explosion of light, of audacities of composition, of unprecedented dissonances, and insolent harmonies. It is savage, irreverent, disordered, and heretical art. Brilliant. When we're talking today, it's considered to be probably the most iconic of all masterpieces of Impressionism. And um, there you have it. The critics take on and call this whole movement Impressionism, as so many of you know. Well, where is Monet going to go? He's going to go out to these beautiful um, regions northwest of Paris on the Seine uh, to paint, to get this extraordinary light. Jérôme has beat him there, and that's what's uh, on. It's going to be that wonderful light. Mo Monet here in a picture at Argenteuil shows this basically the same um, zones of interest as Le Nôtre did in the 17th century, and that is earth, water, and sky. And the sky uh, and the earth sort of come together in the reflective device of the water. So this is just daily, basic, uh, basic daily life, and you see a lot of pollution coming up here. And uh, there's not a train coming over the bridge, but in a moment there will be, and Monet has no problem painting them. In the same area, northwest of Paris, we have a restaurant very well known called La Grenouille. It's sort of the froggery, and the reason why it's called that is people come and have a luncheon on, on a new thing that, thank you to the British, uh, is called the, the Le Weekend, or The Weekend. And everyone comes out to have uh, lunch on the terrace, and then afterwards to adventure across that little bridge onto the island, and many of them end up sort of skinny dipping over here on the side. My point about this picture is that, it, although it's a Monet, this very same year, Renoir is going to paint about the same scene. So what we see is it's not so much the subject matter, per se, and certainly not, uh, a picture of uh, you know, Louis XIV or Napoleon III, it's all about how life, uh, uh, sorry, light is falling on life. And you know, it's really across the board experimentation with this notion of luminosity. And you all know it by heart and all forms of painting that's soon going to be a la mode here uh, the afternoon on the, uh, sur de la Grande, on the island of the Grande Jatte. And this picture of Seurat's masterpiece is in Chicago, as you know, and a, a massively important picture for the era. Monet will s s not go to this micro sorts of impressionism, but it just shows the same sort of afternoon, the same sort of modern life unfolding before us. In 1866, the Déjeuner sur l'herbe allows you and me and other slightly normal people to walk right in the canvas. It's so big. And we have life-size people here, not Louis XIV and would-be Maya Antoinette's, but rather people such as you and I enjoying a, an afternoon picnic. What Monet's most interested in, of course, is looking how that light is falling onto the little nap, the little uh, arrangement where they're about ready to have lunch. 
Well, all of a sudden, travel is in because la bête humaine, the train, has been invented, and now it's going all over the place and making trips that people before spent days doing in carriages and horses. Now they're able to get up to the coast of Normandy in a couple of hours. It's going to translate everything into a novel world of movement. And Monet is going to go right with it. And he's going to go home and up above that, that, this part of the coast. He's going to go to his aunt's house here at Saint Adresse. Saint Adresse would be sort of like the Hamptons of uh, New York or whatever. whatever. And his, his um, uh, aunt has this beautiful garden. In fact, off the sea on the other side of the house, a very large garden. And um, here we have pictured Monet's father, the one who's not very happy about his son, his aunt who's sitting under the umbrella. Monet is posing himself out on the water, looking at all the ships coming in and out of the port. And a stand-in for his wife, Camille, who's not acceptable in their society, uh, is just a lady there. Camille is probably home sulking because she wasn't invited to the party. But um, that will be it. This is still a, a France full of very striated um, classes. And at saint Adres, um, is it's opening out to the world of these beaches up here where Monet's subject matter will be just simply Parisienne au bord de la mer. They don't look like this anymore on these beaches where we spend our summer, actually. They don't have anything other than a little tiny bottom left. Um, and my uh, wife's mm, grandmother, who was born in 1880, has described all this to me. She just died the year of our marriage, so, my God, almost half a century ago. But all of her stories recount all of this, as she was as a young girl on these same beaches in 1900. Now, Monet is going to take off just like this modern woman who knows how to play tennis and ride a bicycle and wear a man's tie, over to Etretat, which is now only four hours from Paris instead of two and a half days. Ooh, that went by fast. Hold on. There we go. And some of you have been to Etretat. This is a very savage part of the uh, Normandy coast that is going to attract Monet and many other painters. And to give you a scale here, I've seen a movie of an airplane fly through this arch. So this is grandiose scale. This is our summer beach. And here it is painted by Monet early on, and it will be painted by everybody, Courbet, the whole lot of them. Well, it's interesting that this space here allows Monet to express his most intimate sort of desires about what it is that makes a great painting. And that is, once again, earth, water, and sky, and the reflections and the movement in all of that universe. Little by little, he's going to come back closer to Paris, to Rouen. And uh, um, this shows the cathedral early on. And the cathedral here, of course, it's the one building that we didn't have to bomb to get the Germans out during the war. So Rouen is not what it was. But uh, this picture of Corot shows it as Monet would have known it. And what he does is he takes a room across the place from the cathedral and installs right along his windows, several easels. We're not in Eden yet, but the easels are there. And what's going to happen there is he's going to be using early post-its and putting 8 to 9 in the morning, 9 to 10, 10 to, and all during the day, he's going to go from one to the next. And what we are eventually going to have are these series paintings of Rouen Cathedral. Now, many critics have talked about the notion that these pictures have a certain religiosity about them. I'm not so sure that that fits with Monet's mindset, but they have a breathtaking beauty, and we could see them as a spiritual uh, experience. I've seen 13 of these in the same room, and it's sort of a really a transfiguration of painting. And you see every hour of the day is going to be covered as this uh, you know, sun eventually sets in the west, and then things become darker and darker, and simply a glow. Same thing now, we're in the 90s. We all recognize here, of course, poplar trees, and we have a child and a mother. But look what happens over time. The poplars are going to simply be center stage, no people anymore, and very soon, almost a minimalist agenda with just water, bank embankment, and sky. 
uh, to show off this uh, amazing ability to reduce the poplars into a simple design of mm, very, very modern feel to it. Same thing with the haystack. Early on, we see these haystacks associated with uh, churches and with little villages. And little by little, they too are going to take on a life of their own so that they almost become, um, here in the snow, uh, uh, the subject matter, revolutionary subject matter, seems almost okay. Or here, maybe absence of subject matter. And then fragmentation, where just the top has been cut off, but all of us know how to read in haystack. Well, some of you are old as I am. You've actually seen these haystacks in France. It's finished now. They bought all of our Caterpillar and John Deere machines, but they were very poetic. So back to the area of Vernon. Monet's going to come from Rouen, and he's going to find a, a little a farmhouse to rent at Giverny. So here we go. His arrival in Giverny, 43 years left for him to start painting like a madman. And what draws him to this area? It's called the Vexin region. And people in France always talk about it being a prefiguration of Normandy because the light is so beautiful here. As Monet says when he moves in, la Normandie, un si beau pays. He's right here at the doorstep of that beau pays. Well, what we see, of course, is a, a, a sort of a high a hillock going down to a valley. And there is the house that he's going to be renting right in here. You can see the, the pink brick. And across the way is a little, it's called the Rue, but it's a little tiny tributary of the Ept, which is a tiny tributary of the Seine. And the Seine River Valley is that going. So we're, we're, in, a, we're in a bit of a valley here. Um, it's a horrifying experience to see the Monet family arrive. Population is 300 in this tiny village, and all of a sudden, overnight, it's 329. It's early D-Day, is what it is. <laughs> Monet is arriving with his new wife, Alice. Uh, his first wife, Camille, has died. Together, they have eight children including Michel, who dies, unfortunately, in a car accident in 1966 and leaves this property of the Fondation de France. And that's when it uh, eventually will become open so that we can see it. There are also 10 servants, because Monet is making money from painting. He's the first impressionist to start just fabricating cash from pictures. He has one gardener, Monsieur Breuil, in the beginning, and eventually he'll have six others. Uh, he has a cook. He has a washer, uh, I think it's called a laundress and also a chauffeur. So he's quite the gentleman painter. And what he's interested in this house is because it has a backdrop of these slight colline in the back. Here, planted when he arrives, are simple radishes and lettuce. And he's going to replace all that so that he can paint what he wants to paint, and that's flowers. He's going to do that in some very novel ways, as we're going to see. Here he is with Alice. I want you to notice this blue and white Chinese pot, because we'll see reproductions now, of course, but they're still in place at Giverny. Starts by renting, and can't afford to buy the house. And Durand Ruel, his dealer in Paris, assists him with that. Well, there the pots are today, modern ones, and there's the house. And you can see exactly why everyone in town was a little bit worried. Monet arrives and paints his house pink with bright apple green shutters. We have a problem, Houston. Here he is in his dining room, and it looks all very well. He wasn't terribly friendly. I'm not so sure we did want to just hang out with all of us, because he had a passion for painting, and that was it. And his daily routine was something uh, perhaps off-putting even to his family. Up at 6, spent his first hour with Monsieur Breuil, walking through the garden, making the lists of the day. He'd have breakfast and then disappear and paint in the garden, out of doors, of course. At noon, if the children were not all at table, there was a big row that was about ready to happen, and then the afternoon disappeared until the sun went down in the garden. That was basically the routine. Never bothered the gardeners once they arrived, only once in a while to trench, because he was rather short, and so to get to the top of those paintings, the painting bottoms would be sunk into trenches, and then he'd still sit on a bit of a high chair to get there. So what we have today is exactly as the room was in that period. So look at this taste. I call it early Elvis. Because it, it's kind of, you know, these two tones of yellow, 
and even painting antique um, uh, uh, commode, it, it's uh, kind of outrageous. So this word is going to get around town, by the way. It's like, you know, pot-smoking folks have moved in. And by the way, Monet is the first one to sort of invite those sorts of comments because he's the first one to have a vast collection of opium poppies. The talk of the town, by the way. And so we see that we move from this into the kitchen, which is sort of a little reverie in blue. And even this little foyer that you would come in when you were um, going to see him, you would first come to this room and wait. Even the foyer, has, even the little clock has been duo-toned out. It's just amazing to me for the you know, period of 1890s. So let's look at the upper garden, just for a moment to get our uh, geography right. And that is, we're going to see that the farmhouse is here. And then this garden built around, originally just uh, lettuce and uh, things to eat, it does have a central alley, a motor passage going up to the front door, to the old farm, indeed. And this is going to be a little bit of a Le Nautrian thing, because Monet is going to turn it into sort of a grand central alley. But the rest of it is going to be sort of upper east or west side New York because these little plots, or what are called these painter box, are going to be full of flowers. And why such tiny little paths in them with only one person's ability to go? It has to do with the fact that he's got to get in there to paint those flowers. So this is what we see, a very organized, logical, Cartesian upper garden that speaks of French historic, historicity in the terms of that modernism. Um, Monet might not have connected all the dots on that, but look at it, and you can. So that central alley in the very beginning of the season, in early spring, looks, we're looking at the front door of the house here, looks pretty Lunotrian. But the difference between the two is that it's not going to stay frozen year round like this. It's going to, whoa, grow. It's going to grow and it's going to flourish. And as the summer goes by, the Capucine, the Nasturtium are going to come out into the uh, central alley, and eventually by fall, it's going to be a dizzying mass of color. So now we know we're you know, at the door of modernity just with that central alley. Well, how is it working? It's working very well, allowing him to have his subject to be able to paint it. I'm keen on everyone understanding that some people might think it looks like a construction site in winter. And the reason is because these big trellises go up all over in, in, in this area of the garden. And what Monet is trying to do, he's trying to get the floral entity up against the sky, and oftentimes in relationship to the house so that he can paint it. So everything in the upper garden is about upness, and we're going to see that's the absolute opposite in the lower garden. Monet is going to talk about his garden endlessly. He's going to say, mon jardin et mon atelier, my garden is my, studio, my painter's studio. And we see here Monsieur Breuil in coat and tie trimming roses early on in the morning. Very distinguished, I think, looking. Um, Monet is already painting at this hour of the day. And here's an amazing recolored uh, slide from the era of Monet, who looks much older than he was in this picture. Um, and I, I think it's wonderful when, when we listen to him talk. He writes in a letter to his friend Octave Mirabeau. Listen to this, ladies. He says, in the end, soil is all that counts. I personally would even suggest that a clod of earth is something wonderful. And I can lose myself in one for hours on end. And compost? <laughs> I love composted earth as one loves a woman. I get my hands dirty in it and see in the steaming lumps the beautiful forms and colors that will rise from it. Totally not an RA acceptable quote either, but you got it. So what we see here is Monet's work that is, is going to use, for example, the iris is here, that blue. He loves all these um, imports that are coming into France now. Uh, and he's going to see them right up against that pink of the house and paint them right away. What we saw in, in the kitchen is not unlike some of the patches of the garden. It's sort of this duo-toned mauve that has very, very almost black tulips set in there with mauve colors and once in a while a tad of something else. And I, I think that uh, everyone just assumes that this is a, an easy thing to do. 
Um, but actually, the colorations from pansies to the tulips to, I can't remember the name of that other flower, but it has got oranges in it. And that sort of range, just in an area of the garden, will be enough, uh, will suffice for him. So it's not as random as you would think when you look at this American catalog to buy flowers by Monet for 1995. And it leads us to think that this is a, a, an easy task for anybody. It says something like, you literally can't make a mistake with flowers by Monet. Uh, of course, there are no painting. There's no paint in that palette. It's all seeds. And they lead you to believe you just take all the seeds and throw them out there, and you're going to get Monet's garden. Well, guess what? Not that easy. What we have are some very interesting color uh, configurations and tonal entities that, are, that sort of express and articulate Monet's interest in these colors by planting forget-me-nots as the base and then letting these duotone tulips come up through it. Or here, the forget-me-nots with just a couple of tulips left and the standard roses in early spring just coming out. Opium poppies, you got it. And then Japonisme. So this is Camille, a picture of his wife that he paints. Um, and she, of course, is in samurai gear and surrounded by fans because Japonisme is in. It's in, in England, it's in, in France, and Monet's keen about it. In fact, his um, dealer, Durand Ruel, has shown Japanese prints. Of course, Japanese art was you know, my Antoinette was keen on it too, but it seems to go in little waves. Well, it comes back big time um, in England and France during this time, in all of Europe, and Monet is seduced by it. And the more we look at some of the ways in which perspective is treated in Japanese prints, the more we can understand his own work. And you see that in the brilliant exhibition downstairs, or upstairs, I don't know quite where we are. But, um, <laughs> You can get an idea of this Japanese unfolding in Monet's brain, and here's how it's going to unfold in the garden. He's going to acquire a little piece of property. Here's the house up here. Across the little road, there was originally a tram here, and there's, it's the old Chemin du Roi. So when uh, the king went from Paris to the Cathedral at Rouen, he passed by here, and Monet's going to take that little uh, bit of a river, and he's going to want to dam it up. Well, listen to what the French are so clever at doing. That would be cheating. Oh, excuse me, Madame l'Ambassadrice. I don't mean it that way. What I mean is, Monet writes the Prefecture de Police in Rouen and says, I'm going to create an aquatic garden like France has never seen. I'm going to bring in species. It's going to be the talk of France. It's going to be a national treasure. Well, they have to post his desires, and all the farmers around say, oh, no, you're not, because my cows are going to belly up and die once they eat some of those exotic flowers from places I don't even know how to pronounce. So Monet gets the kabash on it. Following winter, gets his pen and paper out. Here's how the letter goes. Cher Monsieur le Préfet, I, uh, I've got all these kids, eight of them. Summer's coming. I want to dig a swimming hole down at the bottom of my property and dam it up so they can go in. Well, damn if he doesn't do it. And he makes, of course, the water garden. And that water garden is going to be, for us, his way of passing into the 20th century, uh, more than just a swimming hole. So this great pond is going to be in relationship to the house, which you can see up just about a block and a half down the hill. And this pond is going to be uh, absolutely iconic as soon as he starts understanding its language. First of all, he's got to plant it. So we have some species that are new to France, brilliant peonies here that are having conversations here with um, maple, a Japanese maple across the water. And of course, in that conversation, we, we have the whole issue of uh, a sort of mystic reflection uh, going on. And Monet is going to be well good at um, planting everything so that you're looking down in the water to get the effect of what's most important here, and that is, is his massive sol pleureur. It's a weeping willow that you can see in the water. So that now, instead of looking up in the lower garden, you're looking down. Monet is very happy at this conceit, and um, he says uh, right away, Mon jardin est mon plus beau chef d'oeuvre. My garden is my most beautiful masterpiece. I work at my garden all of the time and with love. What I need most are flowers, always. My heart is forever in Giverny. Perhaps I owe it to the flowers that I become a painter. Well, Cézanne comes and visits, and he writes back, Monet n'est qu'un œil. 
mais bon Dieu, quel œil. Monet is only an eye, but what an eye. And so we've got him working in this lower garden on his canvases, doing absolutely the opposite of what he do, did up by the house. And now with this downward focus, he's going to go into sort of the mysticism and mystery of the Orient that's all related to this experience. The water lily suite is going to take all of this and reduce it. So we have here, we don't even see the bank anymore, so we don't have roots or anything. We don't even have soil down below. We have no sky. It's just irises against water. And Monet here, he is looking around, cocking his head around, looking, wait, I'm having a private moment here painting, and that's exactly what he's doing. And for the most of these times, we see him pretty much alone in the garden. Once in a while, the children would come around, or his wife, but this is pretty much his solace. And so, pictures such as this, early photographs of the garden, are going to turn into things such as this, which looks like Turner, yes. So we've got um, a very interesting thing coming right across the channel. And here, so you see the transition, that evolution going on. Very interesting. And little by little, it goes further and further towards a sort of fragmentation, a sort of different kind of use of color and brushstroke to this. Here's the weeping willow like you've never seen it. And I had to tell you it was the weeping willow, didn't I? Well, the bridge. Probably the most iconic piece uh, of the garden is going to be central for us to understand that. And of course, right out of Hiroshige, this bridge comes, a moon bridge, which Monet slightly descends. And I like this image because it allows us to understand that our passage from Monet's 19th century experience of, of this figuration, bridge, oh, I get it, we pass over that bridge and we're going to go right now toward a new notion of representing reality. So everyone sees these first pictures from the late uh, 90s of the bridge. And we're going to see over time how that bridge is slightly going to be configured into something more than just a bridge. In fact, it's going to sometimes become um, a, a reverie of maybe what we could call absence of a bridge. Oh, down, down, wherever, upstairs, you're going to see some great examples of that bridge. Monet's going to sometimes build it up so he can put uh, flowering species over it. It's going to change all of the time, and the pictures are going to follow that same evolution. And so this is really going to be a study site for that iconic passage that we've been talking about. Oof. And you'll see some great examples of this, too. Now, mind you, toward the end, Monet is having a very uh, difficult problem with his eyes and cataracts. He's had very painful surgery. So things are basically going to get much darker. But his stroke is going to be freer to this. Oh, wow, that thing's going faster than the freeway in California. I, I, I just touched it once. We've got to go back. Sorry, folks. Here. Whoa, whoa, hello. Mustang Sally has gone wild here on me. <laughs> God, I can't even, it's not even working. Now. There we go. Okay, well, you get the point. Let's go back to the boat. Monet will have two of these. He'll put himself in the boat. Out he goes for the day, paints like crazy. And so he's in the water showing us what's around him. That'll be important in just a minute. I don't know what I missed in there, but uh, you can fill it in. And so little by little, what we've got are more and more pictures of just looking down into the water and stratifications of tonal qualities that force our eye actually to fill in so that soon we're looking at the sky by looking down. Monet's going to paint for an exhibition that's done in 1900 in Paris, 40 canvases the same size, all representing those water lilies. And at Boston Museum of Art put 39 of them together. One, one private entity would not give the picture up, but 39 of them in one room is pretty staggering. And we see now it's become sort of a, a calligraphy. It's sort of a, a kind of a, a, a writing that's going on here. And here we have it too. We're just the idea, I don't know where this is talking. There, just the idea of a water lily pad is going to be insinuated, just suggested. The absolute opposite of these photographic, fantastic but fantastic pictures from golden age of uh, Dutch culture. 
where even today botanists can tell you exactly what flower it is. Monet's not interested in that at all. He's interested in striated a whitish, yellow line, and blue. Very, very modern. Painted right there. Some of the pieces of the canvas are unfinished. His pal will come many times to Giverny. And this is the prime minister of France, a great French statesman, Clemenceau. You can see the two of them on the bridge. And Monet's been talking about a project. He's been absolutely um, downtrodden by World War I. His wife has died during the war. And Clemenceau says, we need the greatest painter of our time to lift France up after these depressing years of the Great War. Monet immediately says he's too old. He can't do it. And Clemenceau will build for him the studio. This is how you enter the garden today and purchase a ticket. He'll enter the studio, and Monet writes, I'm now painting the water lilies from memory. Well, it's absolutely Proust. It's fantastically Proust. And so he's going to start his work on les grandes décorations. Of course, the word decoration in the 20th century is a no-no, but it's so perfect when you think about les grandes décorations. And here we are with these grandes décorations installed in the basement of the Orangerie in Paris that you all must see. In my mind, these two rooms show the greatest piece of art made in the 20th century for our understanding to passing from 19th to 20th. Now, this is what Monet says. Imagine a circular room. Well, it's actually two circles. A foyer that kind of absorbs when you enter because it's completely white. You come into the first room, move into the second. This is eventually infinity represented, and it's an infinity of beauty is what it is. He says, imagine this room whose walls would be entirely filled by a horizon of water spotted with these plants, walls of transparency, sometimes green, sometimes almost mauve, the calm and the silence of the water reflecting the uh, flowering display. The tones are vague, deliciously nuanced, as delicate as a dream. Well, Clemenceau says it's a don royal, a royal gift. He calls it une symphonie. Louis Gillet calls it un coup de théâtre, variations on the theme. Of course, a musical sort of an idea here. Uh, Debussy is right alive in these rooms when we see it today. I call them mirrors of dream, and uh, Louis Gillet called them miroirs de songerie. Georges Graff says it's a, an oriental tapestry of precious nuance. And Marcel Proust, of course, almost the best of all, says it's a parterre celeste, it's a, a celestial parterre, including the theme, of course, of earlier gardening with Le Nôtre all the way into the 20th century. But best of all is the surrealist André Masson, whose work I don't always love, but listen to what he says about this room. He says it's la Sistine de l'Impressionnisme. It's the Sistine Chapel of Impressionism. So go there this summer. It's absolutely on your assignment list. <laughs> so that when we see what happens and what unfolds in this room is just this Debussyan sort of Debussyan symphony of light, of color. And we are plunged into that little boat with Monet down here looking all around us at this film of Giverny, a hundred miles away from this museum due west, but we are right there, right there in this universe of transfiguration into a new way of seeing and a new way of thinking in terms of representation. And here, where parts of the canvas are completely laid bare, it's really the, a, a, a gesture, an ultimate gesture of modernism, so that when we transition from this to this, not Monet, by the, way, by the way, Jackson Pollock, half a century later, in Pollock's Enchanted Wood, which I think is a little less enchanting than Monet's pictures, we have really uh, to thank Monet for his imperial gesture of having launched this sort of painting. And out in Los Angeles, uh, um, Kelly Weiss is doing imagery that is in the same trajectory. Um, a very sort of 
faithful rendition of Monet's genius. But finally, it's, <clears throat> curiously, Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger who take it on in their salon. They have three rooms at the Chateau Gabriel, right above Normandy. I think it's for sale right now, for those of you who are interested in acquisition of a property in France. It, cap it captures these sort of essential configurations of Monet's masterpiece at the end of the 20th century. Of course, he has, he has this sort of painting all around surround sound, surround painterly gesture in this uh, world that, that Mr. Saint Laurent felt was a kind of a, a, a way to uh, marginalize himself from the pressures of what I'd call runway deadlines um, and to recreate in Monet's own words. Listen to this, it's so brilliant, it's so brilliant. Monet says, for a moment, the temptation came to me to use the theme for the decoration of a drawing room carried along the walls, enveloping all of the partitions with its unity. Now, this is right after the war, seeking unity. It would have produced the illusion of an endless world where for all of France thought that the world was coming to the, an end, of course, with the Great War, of a wave with neither horizon nor shore. Nerves exhausted by work, we're talking post-industrial revolution, huh? would have relaxed here. And to anyone who had lived in that room, it would have offered a refuge of peaceful meditation in the middle of a flowering aquarium. It's a really a thought about peace and a way of finding that peaceful place. And you know, half of Monet's family flees during the house in Giverny during the First World War, and Monet stays on. He says, c'est mon devoir, it is my duty. I must stay on and paint. Obviously locating a sort of solace in that activity. My conclusion is brief. Monet's modernity was a radical departure from established painterly traditions toward another aesthetic rooted in the artist's quest, first to create his subject matter, the garden at Giverny, then to paint it over 500 times. In doing so, his revolutionary passage from representation to abstraction constitutes, in my mind, the modernist gesture par excellence. In his last self-portrait, painted in 26, we see an old man who's been through a lot in terms of his art also. When he dies, Clemenceau calls for a state funeral. Victor Hugo had state funeral. So all of a sudden we are in a realm. And when the legendary statesman saw the coffin approaching the Place de la Madeleine, where it was going to start going through Paris, of course this coffin was mounted upon a sort of a carrosse, sort of like when we had Kennedy's um, big funeral in America, covered with black drapery. The great statesman came up, unfurled the black drapery in front of thousands who were there lining the street and pronounced, there will be no black for Monet. Of all the self-portraits, and this is in your exhibition, my favorite is this, where Monet has taken his picture in a shadow in, of course, those iconic water lily ponds. Brilliant, isn't it? So these final words. I've got to get this picture to come up. Where are you? Oh, where were you when we needed you? Oh, no, we don't want you. We don't want you. You're out. Oh, here. Sorry about that. <laughs> there has to be a technical mess somewhere, else it wouldn't be a good lecture. Um, what Monet is going to sum up, this final image of him, and you can tell he's got Coke bottle bottom glasses by now. He's refused to see the doctors again for one of those painful surgeries. But he's sitting down here, alone in the garden, contemplating its beauty. And he frames it all up in the most wonderful words. He says, En dehors de la peinture et du jardinage, Je ne suis bon à rien, which translates roughly to this. Outside of painting and gardening, I'm good at absolutely nothing. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Eric, being rather um, modest as well as a very brilliant person, he said, don't say thank you at the end. I'm rather moved to say, I'm rather moved, actually, by, by what he said. I'm also, those of us who owe a lot to Monet, the painters here, would expect me to say this. But also, I don't know about you, my heart rate has gone up. <laughs> Is that, is that true? <laughs> That's extremely unusual. But what I do want to say is we're very proud and grateful for Eric having given this talk. What he's done and the passion with which he's spoken about art is very RA. <laughs> so we're really delighted to have Eric. So thank you again, Eric. Thank you.